could have the, the Hoibrex from Bonn, because in Bonn. <laughs> yeah, I am, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about complex multiplication and twister spaces. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so in this way, uh, I get to talk in the Shafarevich seminar, which is a great um, honor. So here's the title, Complex Multiplication and... Um, yeah, wo, wo, sure, yeah, tut. Uh -huh. Hi, Sasha. We are creepy. Okay. I'm very sorry for being late. No problem. Uh, I just started. Uh -huh. Great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, um, and, and the goal of this, this, this project of mine is um, to understand uh, in what sense algebraic and arithmetic properties um, propagate along twister spaces, which is a highly a transcendental transcendental notion. And at this point, so I have made some, some observations. Um, the arguments are all essentially elementary and uh, I'm still looking for like the deeper reasons why, uh, why these things uh, seem, to, uh, seem to happen. So let me start with um, recalling some, uh, some basic um, Hodge tree, uh, which I need to, uh, to phrase my, my results uh, later. So um, uh, if S is a complex um, K3 surface, then we associate with it, uh, of course, it's um, neuron severi lattice. And I usually, I work with uh, Q coefficients. And then uh, the orthogonal complement is the transcendental lattice, again, with uh, uh, Q coefficients, which you can also define as like the minimal uh, non-trivial uh, uh, hot structure uh, in, in, H, uh, in H2. Um, so the, all this uh, sits in the second uh, cohomology with uh, rational coefficients. And the Hodge decomposition, of course, uh, has um, three parts. So the 0, the 1, 1, and the 0, 2 part. Uh, the neuron severi sits uh, totally in degree uh, 1, 1. Um, and if S is uh, projective, then, in fact, you do have a direct sum here. Uh, they together they both spend the the full cohomology, uh, and you also have that uh, the transcendental part is an irreducible Hodge structure. Um, so, which means that uh, there exists no um, there is no proper uh, sub sub Hodge structure uh, in T. This is not always the case, but um, for projective ones, um, that's true. So um, uh, abstractly, so in, in, in most of the arguments, I'm actually not really using that I have a K3 surface or anything. I'm just using the, the notion of this, uh, of this of the hot structure that is provided uh, by the transcendental lattice of a K3 surface. So um, what we have abstractly um, is the following. Uh, so we have a Q vector space. So that's a my t, that's a vector space over q. And I will denote its dimension uh, by r throughout. And uh, uh, it, it comes with a non-degenerate pairing. Um, um, such that, uh, and, and of course, the, uh, the Hodge decomposition of the associated complex vector space, t120, 11, and uh, 0, 2. The two zero is uh, one dimensional and the generator I usually call, uh, call sigma. And then there are, there are properties uh, I want them uh, to satisfy. One is, uh, uh, for instance, I want the one one part to be orthogonal to the uh, two zero part and so on. And uh, maybe the most important part is that the uh, pairing is, um, is positive on, um, on the plane I can associate with, with T, which is spent by the real and imaginary part of, uh, of the uh, generator of uh, T two zero. Okay. And now there are three cases. Um, the, the first one is, that's the general case. So it's the, there's the general, there's the special, and there's the strange case. Um, so 
So the special, the general one is that uh, this positive, this positive plane here, does not contain any non-trivial rational classes. So the intersection with the rational vector space is just uh, just zero. The special case uh, is where this PT is actually um, defined over Q, so you can pick a, a rational basis. And uh, in this case, at least if uh, T is irreducible, this just means that uh, it is all of, the, of T after passing to the real vector space. So that means the, the R is actually just, um, just two. So this corresponds to the case uh, that the Picard number of S, so in the geometric case, is uh, maximum. And then there's the strange case um, that they are not, so that PT is not defined over Q, uh, but it does contain some rational, uh, oops, uh, some rational classes. So it's a, it's a one dimensional uh, 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 rational vector space. Um, later, so I can't say really anything about these, these K3 surfaces. I don't think they have a nice algebra geometric uh, description. And in the, in the main results, I will have to exclude them actually. Uh, they are just strange. Okay. So um, then whenever I have this, I can associate two fields um, to this T. So I will call them uh, KT. Uh, capital K T and small. Daniel, case. yes. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, can you say something about uh, the Picard number of these strange K threes? Uh, no, they can be everything. Um, they cannot be twenty, but I think uh, apart from this, I think they can actually be anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what the other line is so so irrational; it can span whatever over Q, right? Right. There's a rational line, but there's another one which is- Right, right, exactly, yes. So I think the very general one, so I can say this in the moduli space of K3 surfaces, if I look at those strange ones, then they, they are real half dimensional. So the moduli space endowed with the right scalar structure uh, uh, will have those, contain those as a Lagrangian, real Lagrangian submanifold. And I think this indicates that we shouldn't look for algebra geometric description of them because they don't form algebraic families. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Okay, so uh, I start, I, I give myself this T and then there are two natural fields to consider, uh, the capital KT and the small KT. And later when, when I have a K3 surface, so when T is uh, the rational transcendental uh, lattice of, um, of the K3 surface, then I will call them uh, KS and capital KS and um, Small case. So the first one is um, uh, the endomorphism field. Um, so this is uh, a KT, um, which is uh, by definition, so I look at the uh, algebra uh, of, uh, um, of endomorphisms of the Hodge structures. So uh, those are Q linear. Uh, and Hodge, so that means uh, the PQ part uh, goes to the PQ part. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, Yuri Zashin, who's listening, so I'm a little scared. Uh, he um, he observed that if T is an irreducible uh, Hodge structure, then in fact uh, you can um, embed. So KT actually sits naturally in C. Uh, the way you do it is you map phi to lambda. So phi is an endomorphism of the hot structure. And since it preserves the, um, since it preserves the uh, two uh, zero part, uh, which is one dimensional, it acts as, as a scale. Right? Can, can people see the writing? I mean, there is a Yeah, I can see the writing. Yeah. The point is whether you can see it. <laughs> no, I cannot see it. There was not, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. I see. Uh, I'm, I'm writing something, but you don't see anything. Or you see the top line? I can't see it as well. Yeah. No, oh. we don't see anything. Okay. We just see the two fields and nothing after. Oh, okay. Um, the, the, the previous page was okay, but this page... Uh, okay. Uh, I, try, I try again. Uh, let me see. 
probably I lost the connection here. Oh, because I'm not watching this screen in the... We can hear you fine, but just... Uh... Uh, well, then I just listen to my voice. Uh, interesting. Why is this not working? Okay, I stop this one and then uh, I try again. Oh no. Oh no, sorry, my airplane. Ah, I'm back. Okay. I think now you can see something, right? Now it's okay, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, all I did was I, I just wrote uh, the definition of the endomorphism field which is uh, up the, end, the, the algebra of all uh, Q linear maps that preserve the arch structure. And then I record this result by Zashin that says if T is irreducible, then in fact, um, I can embed the, uh, the endomorphism field naturally into C by, uh, by mapping phi to lambda, where uh, lambda is um, uh, determined by the property that uh, phi on two zero is actually just lambda times the identity. Okay, and of course, um, and this will come. This will I will use this uh, in a second. Uh, this makes is, say again, uh, which is small k. Okay, small k I haven't defined yet. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, coming up in a second. Um, um, so this is the endomorphism field, capital K, um, and uh, and of course T becomes a vector space over over capital K T. Okay, and then there's the period field. I put this here on the field K T, um, and um, which is defined as follows. I take um, the residue field of um, the period point uh, of the arch structure. So here the X T is uh, the line. So it's the point that corresponds to the line in the uh, in the projective in the in the in the complex vector space T Q uh, C um, so explicitly concretely if I um, if I uh, give myself a basis um, of my rational basis of my uh, vector space uh, Q say gamma I so then uh, then I uh, define the the period point um, just by taking uh, the periods of, uh, so x, i, it's just the pairing uh, of the two form sigma over gamma i, or which is the same as the, the pairing of, of sigma and gamma i, okay? And then, and then the period, the residue field is nothing but uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the extension of Q um, I get by joining the coordinates, the affine coordinates of, of the point, uh, of the period point. Okay. Here, of course, I need, I need uh, X1 uh, non-zero. I mean, one of the coordinates will, of course, be non-zero. Let's assume that's X1, and I'll come back to this uh, um, in a second. Okay. So um, there's no geometric explanation or interpretation uh, other for the, the little, for the period field, other than the one I've just given by, in terms of these integrals. For the, um, for, for the endomorphism field there is. Daniel. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm sorry, but if you rescale sigma, then uh, this xi will be rescaled and the field will change. No, uh, here you see, uh, I divide by x1 ah, by one I coordinate. Ah, so it's really the f one coordinate. It's really, you should, you should Thing. So you have a you have a projective space over Q, uh, and you have a non closed potentially non closed point X T in this thing, and you take the residue field of this. That's all it is. It's, uh, it's but but, uh, but then does it depend on the chart you use, on the affine chart? No no no. I mean here so I just could, no. It's just the. It's, I mean that that's the. Diff, I mean if I'm just spelling it out what it is. What the residue field of a point in a projective space is. Yeah sure sure sure. Sorry. Uh, 
I mean, it's a little unusual to do this if you think in terms of peer domains. Usually, we're not supposed to look at the peer domain as an algebraic variety. I mean, there's some recent activity on this, but uh, usually, some of you are supposed to think of this as some op real open subset of a comp of a quadrant. And nevertheless, I want to take the period, uh, the residue field of it. Okay, so geometrically, um, if so, if um, if T is really the transcendental uh, lattice uh, of a K-T surface, then uh, the uh, Zarshin's endomorphism field here, so this would be then Ks, uh, is nothing but um, the two-two part. Oh, is, is the interesting is the interesting uh, part in the two two classes uh, um, on the product, right? So there's an, there's a there's a there's a trivial part in in the in the in the Hodge uh, in the class in the space of Hodge classes on the product, um, uh, which comes from taking products of exterior products of line bundles, and then there's the interesting part, which is this one. And that's essentially the same as the endomorphism field uh, by Poincaré duality. Okay, so that's the geometric interpretation of, of the endomorphism field. By the way, wasn't it proved by Buskin or somebody that this is actually algebraic or something? I'll, I'll come to, I'll mention this in a second. Um, um, so um, uh, the first observation is the following. So uh, these two fields, I mean, they're completely different fields, but once it's natural, so they're both subfields of C by definition, uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, and uh, the capital sits, the bigger field sits in the small one. So capital K uh, sits in small K. I yeah. mean, it acts on the small one, right? For no obvious reason. Um, right, so here's the, here's the yeah. argument. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if, if you take an endomorphism, which is X by lambda on the, on the two zero part, then you can uh, interp interpret the multiplication of lambda uh, with x1 as just the um, pairing of, um, of gamma 1 with the image of, uh, of phi of sigma. So this thing here is nothing but lambda times sigma. Um, and then uh, you adjoint, I mean, it's all linear algebra here. Uh, you adjoin, so you take the transpose of, of gamma 1 of, of uh, phi and you get this one. And this now is again a Q linear combination uh, of, of, of your basis vectors. So this, this whole thing becomes a linear, this rational combination of, uh, of uh, XJ, XJs. And then if you divide, if you divide by, uh, by the X1 here, then you get that lambda is actually a linear combination of, the, of, the, uh, of elements in the, in the, in the small field KT. So otherwise, um, otherwise these two fields are completely different. So this comment that the endomorphism field of course acts on T means that uh, its degree um, is uh, small, is bounded from above by uh, the dimension of T, obviously. Put this up here. Um, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the small field uh, is is quite the opposite. Uh, this uh, its degree is bounded from below by the dimension of t. So typically, this uh, the field k t is not algebraic, and its transcendence degree will actually be uh, something big. Uh, so it will be, I think, r minus two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I don't think there's much known or you shouldn't expect anything about uh, general information about this, this small field KT. But again, due to Sarshin, we know quite a bit um, about uh, capital KT. Uh, he says it's, it's uh, either totally real so RM for real multiplication. So uh, this means uh, for all embeddings of your number field, so KT is a number field, uh, the image will be, um, will be real, or it is, uh, it is CM, so it's complex multiplication, uh, and this means uh, it, is, it is a degree two extension, um, degree two extension, so this one of a totally real field, 
Now this has mere multiplication. And the lambda here has the property, so the, the lambda is of course um, an element in the total real field and has the property that it becomes, uh, so it's always real, but it's always negative real. So that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, Okay, one remark which is technically um, extremely uh, important is that if you have this uh, CM field, then you find a primitive element of norm one. And if you interpret this, if you interpret this lambda as an endomorphism of the hot structure, that means uh, uh, that this is an isometry. Remember the, the, the T here, our transcendental letters had a, had a pairing and, uh, and, um, and so you can ask an amorphism to be compatible with the pairing and that's, that's an isometry. And for CM fields, you find a primitive, actually many primitive elements of norm one and that's extremely helpful. Okay. So this norm is actually, com turns out to be compatible with the pairing. Uh, yes, so that turns out to be the, the same, I mean, the one given by the pairing. Yeah, that's some, some, something Sashin um, proves as well. Mm -hmm. It's not completely obvious, is it? No, no, it's not. It's a little technical. Also, the, the transpose I'm, I, I was using up here, uh -huh. this, this corresponds to complex conjugation in the, in the field. Um, right, okay. right. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, one says, uh, so that's a definition, when we say that T has complex multiplication, if um, uh, of course, you want its endomorphism field to be CM, and uh, some people don't put this, but I think the better definition is to put this extra condition that has maximal um, uh, degree. So that means the dimension uh, of T, but now over over the its endomorphism field is one. Um, and in fact, uh, it needs an argument, but you you can forget about the first condition. Um, once you know the once you know the degree is maximal as big as it can be, then there's no so it cannot be a real multiplication, not not be a totally real field. So somehow this condition is uh, is not really needed, but it's naturally somewhat to put it there. And then there's a little lemma you can prove. Excuse and me. So you exclude the the big spectral number just because it's the only case where the endomorphism is not commuted, right? In that case, it's like a I don't know, matrix I algebra. I'm excluding what what case? Well, the, the maximal Picard rank. No, no. Then the then the CM field is degree two, and the transcendental uh, lattice is rank two. Can there be a situation where you have like a whole matrix algebra of endomorphism or stuff like that? No, it's always a field, right? Always a field. So the, the endomorphism field is always a field. Okay. Well, actually, oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so go ahead, Yuri. Uh, actually, if the rank is maximal, then uh, the K3 surface is always CM. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll mention this in a second when I come to CM for, for, for K3. Okay. No, I get it. So, so always an embedding into C anyway. Right. No. Yeah, okay. Okay. So then the, the, you prove a little lemma um, that uh, tells you you can actually rephrase this also in terms of the period field. Namely, it turns out that this is equivalent to KT be a, a CM field. Remember, this is, this is rare. Usually, I mean, it's bounded from degree, from below by the, by the rank, uh, but typically it's actually not even algebraic. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another uh, description of CM. And of course, you want it to be minimal. I'm not quite sure, uh, I haven't really thought, thought, the, thought this through, but maybe uh, I, can, I, can, I can forget about this, this condition. Maybe once uh, I know that its degree is minimal, it implies already that it's complex multiplication. It's, it's possible, I haven't really thought this um, through. And, uh, and both together, of course, you find that CM is equivalent to the, uh, the, to the condition that period field and endomorphism fields are just the same. Okay, um, that's about uh, CM uh, for abstract hot structures. And now I want to come to, uh, um, to K3 service with complex multiplication. Any questions on the last slide? Uh, go on. I can always go back. Anyway, okay. So now uh, let's look at, uh, at the projective K3 surface. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we have this irreducible uh, 
rational transcendental letters. Uh, and then uh, one says that uh, S has CM, of course, if, uh, if the T has. Oh, sorry, let me put this here. If uh, T has, and this, of course, is now is equivalent to capital KS and a small KS being the same. So just, just so I fix it. Uh, so what's the level of generality for this abstract stuff? You just take anything with weight two, with right. yeah. Um, so that, this was essentially uh, where is it? Here, this was essentially the setting for for the T. Uh, this is what what I would okay. call a K three so structure. H to one is one dimensional, and that's it basically. Essentially, plus this uh, this this positivity yeah. condition here. Ah, yeah. yeah. Sure. So yeah, yeah, without the without the pairing, nothing really works. Yeah. It always has to be polarized, of course. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not quite, because in a second I will talk about non-projective cases, and I will still use these transcendent lattices, which are then not strictly polarized. Okay. Okay. Um, so now let's uh, let's uh, go through some examples and some uh, basic properties. Um, so the first one is if um, S is a complex multiplication, then its Picard number is even. That's because, um, oops, uh, because um, in this case, it's a, it's a vector space over CM field. This is the M field has, has even dimension. Um, but that's actually not the, um, not the right way to put this. The real, re I mean, the, so this wouldn't work for hypercalar. The real, re the real uh, result is that the um, dimension of, of the transcendental part is even. So you could do the same thing for hypercalar with B223, and then the, the, Betty num the Picard number would be odd, but the, the dimension of the transcendental part is, is even. That's the important thing. Also, <clears throat> ah, yeah, maybe I should have said this. Uh, actually, this notion, I think this is the first time complex multiplication for K3 surfaces was considered uh, was by in the paper by uh, Piatetsky, Shapiro, and Shavarevich, uh, which was published in, uh, in 71. And they also observed uh, that, um, that, that all, well, they proved that most CM fields can be realized uh, as CM fields of a K3 surface. So, and recently this was, um, so let me put this, Piatetsky, Shapiro, and Shavarevich. And recently this was complemented by uh, Terman. So whenever you have a CM field uh, whose degree is allowed to act on, on the transcendental letters of a K3 surface, then in fact there exists a K3 surface as K3 with complex multiplication and its field being this, this given field K. Um, <clears throat> Um, as as you also said that whenever you the big and how do they look in the moduli space the set of such K three um, yeah that's that's an interesting question maybe you really know the answer so uh, if you look at moduli space of polarized K three so it's those with complex multiplication are dense what I don't know is if you also fix the the endomorphism field the CM field whether this set with a fixed endomorphism field is still dense in the moduli space of polarized K threes. I would, I would expect it to be dense, but I must confess I never checked it. For yeah, me. yeah, I, I would expect it too, but I don't, I don't, I haven't seen it proved written down anywhere in the literature. So I guess so for even for fixed and more for fixed CM field, the the this the set of polarized K features with this CM field should be dense. But it's good that you confirm this. Uh, this expectation. Okay, so if the Picard number of of uh, of row is, uh, of S is 20, then it automatically has a complex multiplication. Um, in general, if, uh, if, if the endomorphism field is, is totally real, then the dimension of the endomorphism of the transcendental part can never be, can never be maximal. It's always, um, uh, it's always bigger than one. It's always uh, bigger than one. Uh, so in this case, when the transcendental lattice, so Picard number 20 means uh, R is two, and then there are only two possibilities, either it's real multiplication or it's complex multiplication of degree two, but real multiplication is not possible because of, uh, of this thing here. 
Okay, for instance, you could also look at, at the Dwork pencil, just to have a, a concrete um, example in mind. So uh, you look at K3 surfaces, um, which are uh, deformations of the femoral quartic. Uh, okay, so and then for T, very general. Xi to the power four. Oh yes, some power is missing. For T, very general, um, the the Picard number of ST would be nineteen, so it cannot be uh, not be CM. And for T in a dense, uh, for T special, but this is still defining a dense set. Uh, the, like for the Fermat quartic itself, uh, this is twenty, and then this is automatically CM. Okay, and maybe just to put this put this down, if I look at, I'll use the notation later. Um, if I look at the moduli space of degree D uh, polarized K3 surfaces, then uh, the set of, uh, of those with complex multiplication um, is dense. And possibly maybe even with fixed, uh, With fixed K. Okay, and then there are some um, some hard effects. Um, so the first one is um, if so again this is Piatetsky Shapiro Shavarevich. Uh, if S has complex multiplication, then uh, uh, S is actually defined over Q bar. So there's a K three surface, so let's say S zero, um, over defined over Q bar such that S is uh, obtained by base change. And this is proved uh, via, via Kuga's attack. Um, there is a more geometric proof. Um, uh, that uses, that uses um, uh, uh, spreading a family and it uses um, um, it uses the Hodge conjecture um, for uh, products of KT surfaces uh, with complex multiplication. And this is uh, proof, was proved by, uh, uh, by Bushkin. Okay. So then it's, uh, so I like this, this proof better, which doesn't use Kuka Satake. Um, uh, because it's more geometric, but I think in the end it's a matter, it's a question of taste. And then there is a result uh, by uh, Tretkov, Paolo Tretkov, uh, which says it's a kind of converse. If, uh, if S is defined over Q bar, so it really is of this uh, obtained by base change from the KT service over Q bar, um, and, uh, and its period field is, is algebraic, then uh, SSCM. Okay, the proof is also via, uh, via Kuo Sataka. So there exist the corresponding facts uh, for abelian varieties. I'd love to have a, a, a different proof, not passing uh, via Kuo Sataka, um, but um, I don't know. Okay, so this is of course the K3, these are the K3 analogs of results we know for elliptic curves. So if you have an elliptic curve, uh, uh, let, me, let me put this here. If you have an elliptic curve um, of this form, then we know that E has complex multiplication if and only if it has to be, to be, to be defined uh, over Q bar. So that means its J invariant is, uh, is algebraic and, uh, and the period to is, is algebraic. So that's the, that's the analog uh, statement for elliptic, uh, elliptic curves. So it would be nice somehow to have a clean uh, K3 picture for this, but um, I only know half of the, of the story. Okay. Um, now I want to um, discuss. Um, but do we know anything about the field of definition in this case? Uh, yes, uh, although I always forget. There are results uh, by, um, is that the, yeah, it's all, um, let's see, what is his name? Uh, it's a student of Skorobogatov, uh, who was actually a student of mine, a master's student, uh, and his name is, 
Sí, muy bien. How embarrassing. Um... <coughs> It comes back, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope he doesn't watch the, the, the video. Okay. Um, yeah, but that, that's known. There is a complete analogy for, I mean, the, the similar, the, the analogy, analogous story for what we have in the, in the case of elliptic. Okay. Elliptic curves. Um, okay, so here's a, is a, is an example which might uh, uh, be useful as a, as a motivation for what comes uh, later. So. Suppose you have an elliptic KV plus a section. Okay, then I could uh, look at at the uh, Teich of Rivich group, so Sha of of S, which by definition is uh, parametrizing all uh, uh, algebraic elliptic KV surfaces such that uh, the Jacobian vibration is, uh, is S. So all these elliptic uh, K-thesis are torsos uh, under, under, under S. Um, by a purely cohomological argument, I can um, identify this um, or describe it as, um, as an eta cohomology group with coefficients in uh, GM, so which is just a row group of, um, of S, of course, or uh, more analytically, um, I can also say, um, I look at the cohomology of O star of S, and then, but then I have to take the torsion um, of it. So that's a, that's a, that's a cohomological computation that, that gives it. Um, but more geometrically, uh, since so we- it doesn't depend on the choice of the elliptic structure. Right? Or, or, well, in the end, not. But a priori, this thing does. Of course, the Brouwer group doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. um, yes, so uh, this description here, uh, so we're looking at elliptic K3 services uh, for which the Jacobian, which is of course just the moduli space, is the original K3 surface uh, S. Okay. So um, um, that means here, this S here is a moduli space and in fact, it's, it turns out it's only a coarse moduli space. Oh, I'm sorry, not the S, but the S. The S is coarse moduli space. Uh, the S here, this is, the S is a coarse moduli space um, on, uh, on S prime. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's, it's really coarse and the obstruction is a Brouwer class um, as a Brouwer class in, uh, in, in S. And in particular, uh, by the usual Mokoyorov setting, we have an equivalence of derived categories um, from of S prime. And now on the other side, because the universal family only exists as a twisted sheaf, the twisted K3 surface as, um, as alpha. So in this, uh, so you see either by a cohomological argument as over here, um, how the Brouwer group comes in, or by a more geometric uh, argument on the right hand side, as an obstruction as an obstruction class. But in any case, what you get is um, a natural isomorphism of the transcendental lattices. Let's say over Q. Now let's put time here. And in fact, in this case, it's even a Hodge isometry. So it's an isomorphism of Hodge structures, but which is also compatible with the um, with the intersection pairing. And then of course, uh, you have, you have uh, obvious, obvious implications. Namely, uh, you know that um, uh, the K3 surface defined over Q bar if and only if the S prime is, uh, is um, defined over Q bar. Or you know that the endomorphism fields are the same. Or, uh, oops, uh, the endomorphism fields are the same. Or the period fields are the same. Or uh, S is, uh, has complex multiplication if and only if S prime has complex multiplication. Okay, so in the in a sen in a sense, these these uh, torsos under under the given elliptic K thesis with a section are indistinguishable from from the original uh, original K thesis. So the point I'd like to make is that uh, maybe it's interesting um, to look at this uh, analytically. Uh, and look at, at the analytic um, Teichel-Varich group. 
So now I'm allowing, I'm looking at the same objects, but I'm dropping, I'm dropping the condition that I'm only looking at algebraic so projective K-thesis. I'm looking now at all K-thesis surfaces. Uh, so elliptic K-thesis, uh, whose Jacobian is, of course, together with the projection to, to P1, is, uh, oops, is, the, um, is the original K-thesis surface S. Oops. So this thing is not necessarily, not necessarily projective. So the same uh, cohomological argument goes through, but uh, we get an isomorphism, uh, not to the eta cohomology uh, over here, uh, but to uh, the uh, analytic cohomology uh, of O star. And we, we do not uh, take uh, the torsion part, we take the full thing. And of course, this one is uh, by the exponential sequence, we are on a K3 surface, uh, is the quotient of, uh, of the one dimensional space uh, H2, H2O. So this is just C divided by uh, this, the transcendental, transcendental lattice. So that's the exponential sequence. Okay. And in fact, you can, you can construct a, case, a family of K3 surfaces over this, uh, over this line here. C, so it's a family of uh, elliptic uh, KT surfaces that contains this, uh, um, the transcendental lattice, but also the, also the rational transcendental lattice. So that's a dense uh, subset. Uh, and then uh, you observe that uh, the, the fiber is a projective KT surface if and only if the T is a point in here. Because what happens if the T is in there, then that means it's, um, it's, element, it's, um, it's uh, image in the quotient of C by TS is torsion. That's equivalent, okay? So you have this family of complex K3 services parameterized by uh, uh, one parameter by element in C. And over dense, open, dense, but somehow discrete set, the fibers are projective, then the elements in the algebraic tetra group. Um, group. And, um, and otherwise the, the fibers are not, not projective. Uh, and uh, and as, as we marked before, so if, if S has a complex multiplication, then, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and you look at algebraic fibers, they all um, um, have, uh, have complex multiplication, have a complex multiplication. And moreover, the endomorphism field is the same as the original one. And of course, since they have complex multiplication, also the, the period field. So keep this in, this in mind, this is, uh, comes up in a classical story. If you allow yourself to look beyond the algebraic tetra variage group at the analytic um, tetra variage group. Okay. Hi, Daniel, may I ask you a question? Hi, Alexei, yes, go ahead. Uh, is there any, I mean, you can probably think about this uh, elements as uh, some jobs or, or start jobs, right? Right. Is there a more categorical interpretation of what is, coin, uh, what is uh, complex multiplication? Um, okay, so you know you're mixing two things. You're mixing complex multiplication and and gerbs or brow elements in the brow group. Right. I, I don't think there is a there's a relation between these two. Um, but you could ask: Is there a categorical interpretation for CM uh, K three surfaces? Just looking at the derived category. Um, So that would mean I have to lift the, the, the information from the Hodge theory up to the category. Um, I'm not sure I know of, of a good interpretation. No, I didn't ask about uh, direct category, I just ask about is there some more objects in the, in the yes, in, the, in modules over these jobs? I mean, in 
Yes, okay. So the, the, the way I think of these things is here, at least, at least over this part, every element in here corresponds so, I, I, okay, I could construct over this thing here, I could construct a kind of universal gerb uh, uh, with a coarse moduli space, the constant K3 surface S. Okay. And uh, analytically, you can do the same over, over here. And in fact, this, this construction of the twister space in this sense has recently been, been done by uh, Brack and Lieblich uh, uh, over finite fields, so for super singular K3 surfaces. And they promote the same thing. You start with a super singular K3 surface, let's say over FQ, and then they uh, look at, at the A1, which is the, the Brouwer group, and construct a, like a universal gerb over this A1. Uh, and then they take some moduli space, which is exactly the same thing uh, as I did here, um, to get an actual family of, of K3 service over the uh, A1. And they want to view this as a twister space in, the, in, in characteristic B. Does right. this answer? Yeah, it goes okay. too far maybe. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so now uh, I finally have to come to twister spaces. Um, uh, okay, so um, so let's see. Let's uh, start with the K3 surface over C. It could also be a, a hyperkähler, and then um, so this is uh, we pick a generator, so a holomorphic two form, and this holomorphic two form gives us. Um, so I should stress here. Now I'm going completely uh, transcendental. That's some of the whole point that I'm doing a transcendental, very analytic construction, and nevertheless uh, see some algebraic geometry. So, okay, so you have a sigma, and I can take this complex conjugate, uh, and the product with sigma is a real volume form on the manifold, on the real manifold N. And then due to Calabi and, uh, and of course, mostly Yao, um, we know that for all Kähler classes, for every Kähler class uh, alpha, uh, so that would be a one, one class, with real coefficients. So for instance, uh, this alpha could correspond to an amp line bundle. Um, there exists a unique, uh, unique Kähler uh, form, a uh, Kähler metric, such that um, it's Kähler form. So how do we get the Kähler form out of the Kähler metric? I put in the, the complex structure here. So this is the complex structure. So I'm thinking of S as a real form manifold with a complex structure uh, I. So as an endomorphism of the tangent bundle. So that gives us the Kähler form. And I want this to be the class alpha. So that so far it's not so hard. The additional condition is, is the critical one. Namely, I want the volume form I get from the real. So that's a real one, one form. I want this to be the same as the original uh, um, uh, volume form given by the complex uh, holomorphic form. And of course, this can only be true up to a, a new a topological factor, which is, uh, is this one, uh, alpha, alpha, sigma, sigma bar. So the main point is that this is constant here. So this is then uh, what we call uh, um, Ritchie flat metric. So uh, in the hyperkähler setting, this can be reinterpreted. Um, so let's, for simplicity, assume uh, we normalized our uh, our holomorphic two form such that the lambda here becomes actually one. So uh, let's assume this is uh, this is uh, just one, and then we. Um, we uh, split sigma in real and imaginary part, real sigma imaginary part. And then it turns out there's a complex structure such that J, such that the real part is nothing but uh, the Kähler form with respect to this other complex structure. And the imaginary part um, is, is another one. So J and K are also complex structures. And of course, you want them to satisfy the usual relation for ij and k. So for instance, uh, k is ij, and they anti-commute. Okay. 
there's something to show, namely that these things are again integral complex structures and so on. Uh, but uh, altogether, you get you get um, a sphere of complex structures. Um, by just looking at linear combinations of i, j, and k. Uh, and uh, the square of an endomorphism, so I view those as endomorphisms of the tangent bundle. And the square has to be minus one in order to be an almost complex structure. And that's the case, uh, it's a little computation, if and only if this point t is actually in a, in a sphere. Okay. So it's a sphere of complex structures, of complex structures. Uh, and, uh, and G is scalar with respect to all of them. Uh, and in particular for each T, I get a Kähler form, but the, uh, what we usually don't have is, uh, so very rarely the Kähler class associated to the, the Kähler form, uh, is rational. So usually you should not expect this to be a rational class. Okay. So that's just the sphere of complex structures. And now the twister space construction. Uh, come again? Okay. There was a question maybe. Not. Okay. So over this twister space, one can actually construct a, a family of complex manifolds, which then is a complex threefold. So as a C infinity manifold, I just say this should be P1 times M and the complex structure I define. So at a point uh, T in P1 and the point X and M, I want this to be, well, I just take the usual complex structure of P1 and I take at the point X, I take the complex structure that corresponds to this point T. Okay, so this is now, this is now a complex uh, threefold. Uh, this, the projection down is in, in indeed holomorphic. All the fibers um, are K3 surfaces. Um, yes. Um, and, and historically, the, these twister spaces, of course, were, were very useful. For instance, uh, they come up in the subjectivity of the period map. Period map, uh, and so also in the global Torelli theorem. Uh, recently, in work of uh, uh, Ben Becker and Christian Lehn, they so they're interested in singular symplectic uh, varieties, uh, but they also find nice results avoiding. Well, I don't know if it's nice, but I mean the results are nice. But whether it's nice to avoid the twister space, but they build up a theory that does not rely on twister theory anymore. So not on the existence of uh, Ricci flat matrix, which is interesting, let's say. Also, Buskin uses these twister spaces. So in his proof, uses a twister theory in his proof. A twister in his proof of the Hodge conjecture. I gave another proof which doesn't, but again, I don't know if it's good or bad. And also the twister spaces are, I mean, they're incredible. Uh, so for instance, they come up in a formality result um, uh, of uh, Dimitri uh, 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 with uh, Lean and Sorga. Okay, uh, so why I like, uh, why I'm intrigued by these, uh, these twister spaces is um, because they, the, the way I, I like to view them is um, by saying, so for instance, I could look at the moduli space of the two, two polarized K3 surfaces. So I take, uh, um, polarized K3 surface SL, and then to this SL, uh, I associate uh, a, vec a twister space. Um, that's a family of K3 surfaces, but frequently the fibers, as I'll make more precise in a second, will hit uh, uh, other moduli spaces of polarized K3 surfaces of different degrees. Um, okay, so here's the, the proposition. Um, so I start with SL uh, as above, and then if, if I pick a very general point, 
then the fiber is definitely not projective, which for instance, you can see uh, by looking at its neuron severity uh, group. Its neuron severity group is nothing, is isomorphic, naturally isomorphic to the uh, orthogonal complement of L. So L was the polarization in the neuron severity of the original K3 surface S. Okay, and this one is negative definite by Hodge index and hence it is, uh, ST cannot be projected. Now, if I'm interested in projective ones, so now let, let's look at those fibers that are projective. In particular, the Picard number has to, has to uh, go up again. Uh, so there are a subset of those fibers uh, where the Picard group, where the Picard number of the fibers is at least the original Picard number. And this turns out to be a countable and dense subset. Okay. And, um, and then you could, you could wonder, maybe is it possible that the Picard number can go up higher than the original K3 surface, uh, than the Picard number of the original K3 surface? And this indeed can happen. So if I look at those S uh, uh, fibers for which the Picard number is strictly bigger than the original one. So you start with the K3 polarized K3 surface, you turn on this twister space, uh, you immediately lose your, your, your ample line bundle. So that doesn't, that doesn't stay uh, one one in the twister family. Uh, so the Picard number drops down, but then it can happen that at other points in the twister space, not only does the Picard number go back to the original Picard number, but even jumps up higher. And this set here is contained in the equator of the sphere. So this is the equator. So let me try to draw a picture. So that's the sphere. So the, the North Pole for me is my original K3 surface. Okay. And, and, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the equator here, this is the S1 where I'm only looking at linear combinations of J and K. Oops, BJ, SCK. That's obviously uh, just, um, just an S1. Okay. So the set where we have an algebraic fiber of the same Picard number is dense in the upper and the lower uh, uh, half uh, sphere. Um, and then uh, strange things happen here. And in fact, the equator, uh, this is also where, this is exactly the locus of, of strange K3 service in the, in, this, in the sense of my first slide, where when the uh, positive plane intersects non-trivially the, the rational T, the transcendental letters. Okay, so um, the picture here, uh, which I find intriguing is not, is a little misleading in the sense that you start with a polarized K3 surface SL, then uh, on a countable dense subset, you find, you find uh, again, uh, uh, projective K3 surfaces, but they do not come with a natural polarization. So they do come with a natural Kähler class uh, here, but that is usually not, not, an ample, not an ample class because it's just not rational. The only thing you know is they have, they do have a, they do have an ample class, but there's no, probably there's no distinguished choice for it. Uh, so in this sense, so when it hits the, the other moduli spaces, that's not strictly speaking, I mean, true. It's up to choosing a polarization on the K3 surface. Okay. So uh, now there are three ways of thinking Hodge theoretically about this, um, uh, this twister space. Um, so remember, if I, when I have a, a polarized K3 surface, then I have this uh, positive plane spanned by the two, uh, by the real and imaginary part of the two form. Um, so that sits in the real transcendental lattice. And of course, I can extend this real transcendental lattice by just adding the class that corresponds to the ample line model. And so I can think of the S2, as I've done above, as parameterizing these complex structures. And of course, I can also view this as the, as the, as the sphere parameterizing the Kähler forms. Or I can view this as, as a P1. 
So this is what one usually calls a twister line. By looking at, uh, at the holomorphic true form of the fibers. And this is really a, still a subspace of, of uh, this complex space here. So uh, it sits in the in the in the period uh, domain. Um, Daniel, sorry, but I think I don't understand something. Uh, so, uh, do you have some kind of polarized twister space which is different from the usual concept? Because, uh, I mean, if you consider the twister line, I really don't understand how do you keep track of this L. No, I don't. I mean, this is what I said. So. Uh, in the in the so you start with an SL so you need the L to define the twister space yes because you know the killer class and then you lose it right away it's uh -huh, just not there uh -huh. Uh -huh. and and here you might hit uh, one of the fibers might be a projective mm -hmm. so that means there exists an ample line bundle on it but you don't mm -hmm. know which I mean there's a choice mm -hmm. here to take uh -huh. so yeah so the L is not dragged along this thing so in a way the situation is not symmetric so because if I you say that the neuron severity is L orthogonal. Uh, and L orthogonal is exactly where. Ah, uh, right. So is of type one one. I mean, <laughs> you want me? So you want to know how those how those are identified? Yes. Because okay, so this is here. This sits this sits in H two of ST. Uh huh. But the 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 way I introduced the twister space uh, here, uh, here. Uh huh. This is just the product. So uh -huh. the cohomology of all the fibers uh -huh. are naturally uh, uh, identified. Uh -huh. I could also. Uh -huh. So this is the same as H two of S. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. And this sits in there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Just the, the the one one class given by the L stops being one one, and all uh -huh. the rest uh, remains there. Yeah. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was about uh, saying about the this P one. This P one here uh, can be viewed um, as sit, sitting in this in this. Uh, projective plane and we say twist a line, but in fact, it's not a line, it's actually a quadric. Uh, okay, and this whole thing sits in, uh, and of course the, this bigger uh, projective space. Uh, or you can think of this as in terms of uh, positive oriented uh, planes, um, as uh, so given by the, uh, by, the positive planes spent by real and imaginary part of the two forms. So here the equator is, uh, is the one that's um, where the uh, Kähler forms uh, have trivial intersection with L. And here, in this, using the description here, the equator is the one where the positive plane contains the class uh, L. So the relation really is omega, the orthogonal of omega t is, is pt. And it depends what you want to do, which one of the three pictures uh, uh, is, is the most efficient. Okay, so now I want to come to this uh, theorem. I'm always out of time. Uh, so this would part four, complex multiplication in, in, um, in twister spaces. And I want to make uh, one observation. You have lots of time. Ah, okay. <laughs> the Russian style. Okay, now let me uh, try to wrap up here. So uh, if, I, if I start with a K3 surface of uh, Picard number uh, 20, uh, then that means, and I, have, uh, and I have an algebraic fiber, then of course it's Picard number has to be at least this 20. So that means uh, it's Picard number is, is also 20. And then I said, and you mentioned this as well, if, if you have a, a K3 of maximum Picard number, it's automatically uh, CM. And of course, also this is a, a CM. So you start with a CM, K3, so with a maximum Picard number K3 service, you look at the twister spaces that comes with an ample class, and, if you, and you pick a fiber, and if this fiber happens to be algebraic, most of them won't be algebraic, but if you, happen, if you pick an algebraic one, its Picard number will be again 20, and again will be CM. And, and this theorem now generalizes this uh, to uh, as follows. So I start with a polarized K3 surface uh, with complex multiplication. I look at its uh, uh, twister space. So it depends on the on the uh, polarization. 
uh, and I look at a point that's away from the equator. So if uh, you pick a point here such that the fiber is algebraic, so that means its Picard number has to be exactly the Picard number of S, and has to be positive, uh, there has to be positive class, positive square class, then uh, ST is again, uh, has again complex multiplication. And a little bit more, namely, I don't know about the comp their anamorphism field, but I know about their maximal real subfields. And they are the same for both. So remember this is, this sits, for instance, this one sits here, uh, a degree, it's a degree two subfield um, of the CM field. Okay. So, uh, an obvious question is what happens along the equator? So originally I didn't think of that the equator could play any role until I realized it does. So, uh, and indeed if, so it's, it's not that my method just doesn't work, uh, it's, you have to exclude the, the uh, equator. So if the Picard number of S is strictly smaller than 20 and you look at it um, at, a, at a point in the equator, then even when the fiber is, uh, is um, uh, it's algebraic, it's not, it's never CM. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the theorem. And now you can wonder, so how, do, how do I describe the, uh, the endomorphism field of the fiber? Um, so in addition, I mean, it's maybe not so interesting someone to give the precise equation. So if I look at, at this extension, which is a degree two extension over the total real field of the original CM field, then this is given by an equation. So I can write down the equation uh, plus, oops, um, gamma times X uh, plus a delta. And now the gamma depends on, on uh, can be written down explicitly. So with, um, so gamma and delta, of course, uh, on the totally real field of the original CM field. And uh, in G gamma, let me write this, is uh, L, L prime times alpha plus alpha minus one. So uh, here the alpha is uh, a pick a primitive generator of norm one. So that remember this corresponds to an Hodge isometry. Uh, and L prime is an ample class on, um, on the fiber. So it's all fairly explicit. I haven't worked this out, but I think from there, you can actually also write down the fields of definitions for these other algebraic fibers away from, away from the uh, equator. Uh, so there is, um, there is, so I can, I think I can, well, I've proved this, this theorem, but I wouldn't say that I really understand it. And uh, uh, why do I say this? Uh, I don't know what the, whether there's a, a geometric or motivic, uh, motivic interpretation for this one. Let me explain why uh, one would want something like this. Remember, um, I, I said the, the endomorphism field of my original K3 surface was the 2, 2 part, the interesting bit of the 2, 2 part in, in the product. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the real part in here can also be interpreted as the symmetric, as the, if you want, the 2-2 two, two part on the, on the Hilbert scheme. So this would be uh, the 2-2 two, two part of the symmetric product of the, okay. Um, and now, and of course, the same holds for, for, uh, for any fiber, for any algebraic fiber. So this is then TT, TT, 2-2. Two, two. And here I have the Hodge classes on the, on the square of some algebraic fiber. And now the totally real fields of these things are, are the same. Uh, and I don't know what's, what's going on here. So this is not, I mean, you would think, well, maybe just if you, if you start with a two, two class on the product S times S, and you, you switch on your twister deformation, then this 2, 2 class will just deform along the twister space and then be 2, 2 everywhere. 
But that's not what happens. None of these two tool classes actually forms along the full twister space. It's just that at least, at least those here, the symmetric ones, if they are there in the original fiber, then they pop up whenever you hit an algebraic fiber, as long as you're away from the equator. Uh, so not in an explicit way, right? Not in a, yeah, in a, some, in a, in a computational, right? I just, <laughs> it's just a computation and I don't know why. So I'd, I'd like to know, I mean, there must be something that happens in the twister space that's not revealed by, by Hodge theory. And they don't have to pop up as actual cycles, right? Effective cycles. They could be negative coefficients and stuff. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah. I probably, you can control this possibly. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't thought about this because usually what we learn is, I mean, we should think of this endomorphism field rather in terms of derived equivalences, or so, and then the we should not yeah, look at surfaces but churn classes, and then there's no positivity. Uh, okay. Good point. Yeah, I actually, actually, yeah. I'm, I wouldn't expect it somehow to. At, at least I, I have no way of controlling it. That, that that's for sure. Um, okay, so it's a little mysterious uh, what what's going on here, and I'd like to understand this um, this better. And maybe uh, yeah. So the, the 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 proof of the theorem is uh, is 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 really elementary. Uh, once you believe in it, somehow you uh, you cook up the proof and then it works. So the only surprise uh, for me, the real surprise was that I had to exclude this equator that I didn't see before, um, but that, that, that comes out of the, of the computation. Um, and maybe just to, uh, so here I wanted to say something about the proof, but maybe I won't. So uh, let me say something about the, the period view because there's one thing that's open. So remember, I told you that we do know uh, the analogous statement of the classical result for elliptic curves, that the KT surface has CM, if and only if it's defined over Q bar uh, and its period field is algebraic. Um, um, and there's, uh, there's a related uh, uh, question which is completely open. So um, let me mention this and there was, I, I don't really have to say anything about uh, behavior in the twister space, but um, let me put this down anyway. So if, if I have a K thesis that is defined over Q bar, so I write this as, as, uh, as obtained by base change uh, from a K thesis uh, with coefficients over Q bar, then all of a sudden I have almost like a unique uh, distinguished generator. Um, at least in the in the two zero part. So this thing here is of course a one dimensional Q bar, and this is one dimensional C, and I could pick a generator in here. Um, so if something is defined over Q bar, I have a Q bar line in in the in the complex uh, vector space that I get by looking at all the holomorphic field forms, and then um, I define the the well, people define the, the period of, of this one, uh, which would be, let me give this a number, a, a name, R, um, where I just say, I take this generator here, this sigma here, and I integrate this over any cycle. And I view this as a number, uh, and uh, since the sigma was, is only unique up to scaling, this number is well-defined uh, up to elements in, in Q bar star. So here, gamma is just a class in, Uh, in the trend, so in the singular cohomology. Okay, so in fact, for um, for for if if the K service has complex multiplication, then this is well defined in the sense it's independent uh, independent of sigma. Oh, of, I'm sorry, of gamma, independent of gamma, because they are all because you have the CM field that acts uh, transitively on the on the on the transcendental part. And, um, and that tells you this number is uh, independent. Uh, and, and then the conjecture that's usually attributed to, to uh, Grotendieck, I mean, he put this down as a, as a question in the footnote uh, somewhere, um, uh, saying that uh, these numbers are never algebraic. So that means R as a class and this quotient is never, is never one. So that means uh, these here are, are transcendental. I 
homomorphic gamma, of course, is not your. So if, you're, if you pick your holomorphic volume form to x to two, two form to be defined over q bar, then the integral over any uh, analytic cycle, real analytic cycle will be, um, will be a, a transcendental number. Uh, so this, this is completely open. As far as I can see, um, you could try to apply uh, uh, some kind of Kuga Sataka because the analogous statement for elliptic curves that's classical and also for Abelian varieties that's known and goes back to, I think, Bustholz. Uh, you can try to apply Kuga Sataka, but that uh, doesn't seem to give the, the, full, the, full, uh, the full statement. And the hope was, um, was that if I take this twister space, um, the twister space, Uh, for uh, SL, um, so then then the S is defined over uh, over Q bar. So I get I get the value. Let me do this here. I get the value R S uh, in e star Q bar star, and I can uh, I can uh, uh, and then so then I know so this is for S, and then I know uh, if S T is algebraic is also is also C M. And I can define the, the period value for CT. So I don't think there's a good way of, if I give you a complex like a Fermat quartic, uh, is it, Fermat quartic is maybe still okay, but if I give you a complex K3 service uh, uh, that happens to be defined over Q bar without me knowing the equation, that's very difficult to compute this, this period value. And the hope was maybe that once I can, uh, I can, def I can uh, compute the period value for the original K3 surface, I also get it for all the other algebraic fibers. Um, uh, and in principle, if, if, I, if I write down this holomorphic two form that is defined over Q bar on the algebraic fiber ST as A sigma plus B sigma bar plus C uh, L, then I can, I, I can, uh, I can compute this, uh, that, that's easy. I compute this R, RST, but uh, so I was hoping that there's maybe a natural choice uh, for uh, this A, B, and C here, for instance, C equals one or A equals one, uh, for which I can argue this one has to be the one that's also defined over, over Q bar. So it's really the question that if S defined over Q bar, uh, how do I discover the, the equations for ST over Q bar in order to compute what's the regular tool form there? Um, but none of the natural choices works uh, because for the, all the natural choices, this R sigma T S T R S T becomes e equal uh, R S, and that shouldn't happen. So these period values should be diff, diff, usually different. I mean, sometimes they happen to be the same, but for different algebraic fibers, they should be uh, distinct unless there is a motivic interpretation for the for for the equality, some cycle uh, that relates the two. Uh, but uh, that's uh, I don't think this is this is uh, this is expected. Um, so maybe to wrap up, let me say this is a little bit like uh, the the situation for the analytic tate of Revich group, where everything is completely controlled. Uh, there's no question about the CM field. There's no question about the field of definition. All the period values are the same, and this is like a specialization of the twister space uh, uh, situation where I can prove certain things, namely uh, 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 proving that the fibers, most of the fibers, algebraic fibers are uh, CM. I can uh, describe the total, maximal totally real field in the endomorphism field, but beyond, for instance, uh, these period values, I don't know. And I think I'm, I need some more intuition for the geometric uh, um, uh, reason for these, for these cycles to pop up at the, at the other fibers. Okay, maybe that's a good point to stop. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. The questions? Uh, Daniel. Yep. Uh, do I understand correctly that uh, uh, you want to say that there is some analogy between this analytic uh, uh, Shafarevich group and uh, the twister line? Yes. Um, I mean, I haven't worked this out fully, but I think the picture is that the twisters, so 
the twister space de depends on the polarization. So on, on an elliptic K3 surface, the polarization will be like a combination of a fiber class plus some multi-section. Okay? And if you converge your, if you let your polarization go to, towards the fiber, right? Then the twister space will actually uh, converge to uh, specialize to the, to the family uh, you get from the analytic cage of RHB. So I, th I think there's actually something, so in the papers by Bragg and Lieblich, when they talk about twister spaces in positive characteristic, they, they say, I think this goes back to Francois Charles, they say those should be, should be uh, the analog of twister spaces over the complex numbers. I don't think this is correct. They should be, they are really analog of uh, specializations of twister spaces over the complex numbers. But you should be able to at least compute the tangent direction, right? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I think this is all, all, all determined by Hodge theory. I can, I can completely compute this. Uh, and so the tangent direction for the, for the stage of RH line, is it like a, is it, is it what you say basically the, does it correspond to the class? Okay, there, yeah, there's a, there's, a con, there's a confusion why some people don't believe in this picture that, uh, that Bragg and Lieblich uh, um, do, uh, that this corresponds to twister space because it seems like you, uh, you deform in towards the Brouwer, so the Brouwer direction. So mm -hmm. in Hochschild cohomology, that will be the H2 of O. All right. Whereas the twister space uh, is something in H11. Right? Mm -hmm. But this can, there is a Fuyamukai between the two that maps the H, so the, uh, so the, yeah. So the, if you, if you turn on the Brouwer class, the Hodge uh, structure gets changed by a class in degree four. It's sigma plus Sigma wedge the B field that lifts the Brouwer class. Okay. So the, the, the formation direction is in H4. And by a Fui Mukai for the Jacobian vibration, this goes back into, into H2. So there's this little confusion. Uh, you have to apply the Fui Mukai before you can see that this is a specialization of a twister construction. Okay. Okay. But, uh, <coughs> Daniel, uh, coming back to my question. Uh, for the, uh, w w what is then the analogy of the derived equivalences? So do you have some natural derived equivalences for K3 surfaces on the twister line? No, I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, uh, simply because I don't, uh, there's, so the transcendental lattices, let's say the rational coefficients, they are not isomorphic hot structures. I don't expect this. Oh, the only thing I, I can say is that this totally real, maximal totally real field is the same for both. So I don't expect, um, what, uh, what do you say, like a derived equivalence of an isomorphism of motives uh, of the CM algebraic fibers and the original K3 surface. I don't think this is what, what's going on, but I don't know what, what else it is. So <laughs> and if, when you specialize to the Tejavarevich family, uh, then so, things become easier, things become some of this, yeah, more special. The endomorphism field is the same for all the fibers, they are all derived equivalent up to twists and so, but I don't think this happens for the uh, twist of, uh, twister space. So it's some kind of a bunch of well, motifs uh, which are different, but for some reason they have a large subset of endomorphisms. Right. The same in all of them. But not all endomorphisms, because the motives are different. The endomorphism is different, but there's this index two thing, which is right. Do you know anything about the fields of definition? Then again, um, I think so. I haven't worked this out, but I think um, still don't can't, can't remember the name. Yuri, you must know what's the name of Skobogatov's student. Uh, oh well, I must. But uh, okay. Oh, that's a, but, that's, that's, German or? No, no, Italian, Italian. Um, Dominica. Dom, Domini, uh, Dom, it's first name. Dominico, that's, I think that sounds right. Vio, Vio. Anyway, okay. Um, um, and so he has, he, he, he built a theory that from the CM field, essentially, you, you, from the endomorphism field, you can write down the, um, the field of definition by uh -huh. adding a little bit more. And I okay. think you can do this 
So now the question is whether you can recover. I think you can, you can do this for all the twister fibers. So I think I should in principle be able to write down fields of definitions. For yeah, all yeah. I mean, the binary question is, do, are they the same or not? Right? No, I don't, think, I don't think they are. Just I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe it's Dominique Valoni. Yes, that's it, Valoni. Um, yes. Um, okay, Dimitri, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't expect it. You're thinking if there's some kind of relation between the two, like the moduli space or something, then it would be defined over the same field. Yeah, I'm, I'm just fishing, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't expect it, but maybe I should make sure that this is really not, uh, not happening. And by the way, in the maximal Picaran case, what happens on the equator there? there just uh, no... Yeah, well, it cannot, uh, uh, it cannot jump higher. So there and then there over the equator, you do have um, you do have uh, CM as well. So that's why I had to exclude here the uh, in this remark. I had to exclude the Picard number twenty case. It's really really different behavior. And then the other case on the equator, you never have CM. Right. In particular, on the equator, it never jumps to uh, Picard number twenty. Uh huh. Which uh -huh. is a little odd, but um, I think that that stands out. But for car number 20, algebraic guys are still dancing in, in the P1 or not? Yes. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is this general thing. They, these are always uh, countable and dense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well, uh, more questions, comments? I have a very speculative question. In a sense, CM fields were invented. Well, again, it's, it's, it's also overstretching in order to answer Hilbert's uh, uh, question about generalization of the theory of complex multiplication. Yes. So, so what about uh, uh, number theoretic applications with respect to explicit class field theory, so to say? Certainly, if I will write of the same type, uh, uh, give you such an answer, but maybe K3 surfaces of same type could help as well. Mm. I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, it's very no, it, no, no, it's a reasonable question. It's a very good question, but uh, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. Um, um, I don't, yeah. Because it, it probably would require some kind of analytic approach. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's also this, this thing about real multiplication. Uh, I mean, we don't really understand these, these, the, the RM fields that, that, that occur here and what's, what's their role. I mean, for in the CM, yeah. Yeah, they, they are, yeah there, are, there are plenty of questions. I, I don't know. Sorry, you. Uh, no, no, you shouldn't apologize. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. Uh, but talking about real multiplication, there, were, there was a paper of Shimura when he tried to construct uh, abelian extensions of real abelian of real of, of, of real quadratic fields, if I'm correct, if I'm not wrong, by using uh, torsion points of certain certain abelian varieties. So, okay. Uh, you know, uh, Again, uh, and since uh, in your twister construction at a certain point you have fixed totally real subfield, maybe. Not interesting, yeah. I mean, you have the, the, there's a natural question one could ask if I, if I now look at a real multiplication K3 and do the twister construction, can I say the same? Is the real multiplication, the RM field surviving the twister? Uh, and I don't think that's, I, I, I don't know really, but the, the methods uh, I use make use of, this, of the complex multiplication. So nothing, I, I use uh, works without, rem, uh, without complex multiplication. Um, but that would say, there is in general, I know there's very little on real multiplication for K3 surfaces. For instance, the question whether the, the Hodge conjecture is true for products of K3 surfaces is completely stuck in real multiplication. There essentially, there's one or two interesting examples and nothing known in, in, in general. Um, so there's something mysterious about the real multiplication. But thanks for the, for the, uh, for the reference to Shimura. Thank you. I'm thinking, thinking about this. But that thing about, uh, you know, fields can size and so on, this is only true for complex multiplication, right? So in real multiplication. No, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to prove anything for real multiplication. Mm -hmm. 
And just on the side, so uh, your theorem is for K3, do you expect the same to hold for hypercalar? Yeah, yeah. I, I just written it down for, for, C, for K3s, but that, that's purely Hodge theoretic and works then for all yes. hypercalar. Yes, it works. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you have any interesting page separation style examples for Lagrangian fibrations, I mean, abelian fibrations of higher dimension? Uh, any interesting, I mean, the, this description is the same, right? Uh, it, twist, twisters are okay, but uh, this, this Tisha Farevich line, do you I have an of this? I think that works the same way for, uh, see, I would think that works the same for, for Lagrangian vibrations of hypercalers. Um, the Tisha Farevich group, I think that all works. Huh? Uh, there's well, okay. Uh, I have to think. There's the question with multiple fibers. You can have Lagrangian vibration with multiple fibers. That's something we don't have for elliptic K3s. All right. Uh, so there might be a little thing where we have to pay attention. Do we have examples of multiple fibers actually? Um, I'm actually not sure. Maybe we I just don't know how to exclude them. Actually at some point wrongly proved that there are none or something like that. But in the end, the point is that we don't have examples, I think. It could, yeah, could very well be true, yes. Uh, uh, I don't know, not on the top of my head. I'm... Okay, thank you. Okay, so for, 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 I mean, this is our style, right? We ask lots of questions. A any more questions? Uh, okay, if not, let's thank Daniel again. Okay, thank you guys. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you very much.